minutes, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, today, we will hear, after my phone stops corking, today we will hear from six judicial nominees, Justice Maria Kahn, nominated to the Second Circuit, Julie Rickleman, nominated to the First Circuit, Judge Margaret Guzman, nominated to the District of Massachusetts, Araceli Martinez Olguin, I hope I did that right, nominated to the Northern District of California, Jamar Walker, nominated to the Eastern District of Virginia, and Jamal Whitehead, nominated to the Western District of Washington. This is an outstanding group of nominees, highly qualified, representing demographic and professional diversity, which has become the hallmark of this administration's nominees. We have several colleagues uh, joining us today to introduce these exceptional nominees, but before I turn to um, one of those colleagues, I want to make uh, two or three points. First, uh, you've undoubtedly been briefed as nominees that uh, part of the custom and procedure of the Judiciary Committee process usually includes from at least one senator a mini bar exam. Uh, which will spring on you topics that you may not have heard uh, since law school. Rest assured that is uh, a good faith effort by that senator, but also know that very few senators on this side of the dais would be able to answer the questions either. <laughs> Secondly, uh, we of course are concerned about judicial temperament, and I think, I hope that uh, this process today will reflect good senatorial temperament. I can only hope for the best. The other thing I would like to raise is a frequent criticism. Members are asked to tell us what they personally believe. What do you really believe? I don't want to hear about precedent and cases. What is your real belief in this? Which puts a judicial nominee on the spot. The Judicial Conference of the United States has directed both sitting judges and nominees not to share their personal opinions. According to the Code of Conduct, also known as the Judicial Canons, nominees, quote, should not make public comment on the merits of a matter pending or impending in a court. The rationale is obvious. Offering personal opinions suggests a nominee has prejudged an issue. It would suggest a future litigants the nominee will arrive with preconceptions and will disregard their obligation to apply the law to the facts. Also, while many of my colleagues on the other side of the table now suggest they are concerned by a nominee's refusal to offer personal opinions, there were no such concerns with previous Trump nominees. In fact, I could go through, and I won't, uh, illustrations of nominees being asked by Democrats for personal opinions and deferring to the same standard that uh, I mentioned earlier. So those are a few of the guidelines uh, as we get started. Uh, we have a number of my colleagues who would like to introduce uh, a, one of the nominees. I urge them to do it with uh, brevity. That does not mean you are not committed personally to them. Uh, but it just means we have six nominees and potentially 12 senators to speak for them. Starting off and setting the standard will be the senator from Connecticut, Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for having this hearing and uh, thanks for allowing me to set the standard of brevity. I hope also persuasiveness. Uh, I'm very, very proud to welcome Justice Maria Edawushu Khan nominee for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Justice Khan was born in Angola and immigrated to this country at the age of 10 with her parents. As impressive as her immigrant story, as inspiring as her accomplishments are her incredible intellect, experience, integrity, and dedication to public service, she served as a law clerk to uh, a district court judge in Connecticut, Judge Peter Dorsey, after she graduated from New York University and Fordham Law School. She then went to serve in the public defender office uh, as a deputy assistant and a staff attorney in the Office of Protection and Advocacy for Persons with Disabilities where she handled civil rights litigation on behalf of individuals with disabilities. She then served in my former office, the United States Attorney for the District of Connecticut, for almost a decade handling criminal investigations and prosecutions, including theft of intellectual property, 
identity theft, computer crimes, healthcare fraud, tax fraud, and bank fraud. In 2006, she began a remarkable career on the bench, appointed by a former Republican governor, M. Jody Rell, to serve on the Connecticut Superior Court, which she did for 14 years. And then in 2017, was elevated to our appellate court, where she served until uh, she was elevated then to the Connecticut Supreme Court. She's been on the bench for 16 years, so she's been a public defender, a prosecutor, a judge of great distinction. And that is probably the reason why uh, 25 former federal prosecutors, including senior appointees of President Reagan and Bush, uh, support her. She's received a well-qualified rating from the American Bar Association. I ask that that letter be put in the record if there's no objection, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. And uh, she's also supported by members of the disability community, other prominent members of Connecticut's legal community. Uh, she is a judge's judge. She is deeply and extraordinarily well qualified. I'm thrilled to be a supporter. And I think, finally, uh, her life experience, her depth of compassion and empathy, as well as her strict adherence and respect for the rule of law will broaden the quality of our Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and I look forward to her swift confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, unfortunately, Senator Murphy of Connecticut uh, has a conflict and could not join us this morning, but joins in the support of Justice Kahn has submitted a statement for the record. Now, Senator Warren to introduce Ms. Rickleman and Judge Guzman. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Durbin. Uh, today, I have the honor of introducing Judge Margaret Guzman, a nominee to the District Court in Massachusetts, and to Julie Rickleman, a nominee to the First Circuit Court of Appeals. I was proud to partner with Senator Markey in recommending both nominees to President Biden for appointment to the federal bench. Judge Guzman appears before this committee with 13 years of judicial experience, having served as an Associate Justice of the Massachusetts District Court from 2009 to 2017, and thereafter as First Justice of the Ayer District Court. Prior to joining the bench, Judge Guzman dedicated her career to public defense work. After serving the committee on the public counsel services from 1992 to 2005, Judge Guzman became a solo practitioner and represented clients in criminal, civil, family law, employment discrimination, and administrative matters. She continued to provide some pro bono criminal defense representation during that time. Judge Guzman has earned support from prosecutors, defenders, judges, the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce, and the Worcester County Bar Association, among others. Those who have come before Judge Guzman describe her as, quote, thoughtful and fair judge. In a letter signed by four assistant district attorneys from Middlesex, they state, quote, we have often gone to her chambers to ask for advice and feedback on our performance as young prosecutors, and they describe her as someone who, quote, whose proverbial door is always open. Beyond the courtroom, Judge Guzman's service to the community is extensive. She has served on the boards of the Worcester Business Development Corporation, Creative Hub Worcester, and Dismas House, a nonprofit dedicated to assisting the formerly incarcerated in reentering the community. She also served on the City of Worcester Planning Board and Worcester County Commission on the Status of Women. Professional service aside, I also believe Judge Guzman should be commended for her dedication to her family. In 1999, while continuing to work as a public defender, she became the legal guardian of her six nieces and nephews for more than three years. During this challenging time, she also assumed caretaking responsibilities for her ailing mother, 
who would later pass in the family home. When describing this period of her life, Judge Guzman stated, stepping in for those children was the right thing to do. When I think about that amazing time, I realize that it was perhaps the most difficult of my life and also the most important. Judge Guzman has lived a life of service of her family, community, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Once confirmed, she will be the first Hispanic judge to serve on the district court in Massachusetts. I am proud to support her nomination to the district court, and I am glad that today she is joined by friends, by colleagues, by her niece, and by two of her sisters, Amy and Catherine. I am also proud today to introduce um, Ms. Rickleman. Julie Rickleman's career has included work in both the private sector and public interest. After clerking for Judge Dana Fay on the Alaska Supreme Court, and later with Judge Morton Greenberg, a Reagan appointee to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, Ms. Rickleman did a one-year stint as a legal fellow in the Center for Reproductive Rights, before spending a decade working for corporate clients and individuals. She worked as an associate at Feldman and Orlansky in Alaska, and then as a senior associate at Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett in New York. Ms. Rickleman joined the NBC Universal in 2006 as litigation counsel, and she would go on to rise within the company first as senior litigation counsel and ultimately as vice president of litigation. She has represented private clients in securities, breach of contract, employment discrimination, copyright and trademark, as well as constitutional law matters. Ms. Rickleman rejoined the Center for Reproductive Rights in 2011 and served in the role of U.S. litigation director beginning in 2012. In that role, she argued two cases before the United States Supreme Court. Ms. Rickleman has earned the support of lawyers in public and private practice, prosecutors, defenders, academics, and former judges representing a range of political perspectives. Her supporters who have worked in government have been appointed by Republicans and Democrats. Despite these differences, they, quote, share a strong belief that Ms. Rickleman is a lawyer of uncommon talent and ability, broad experience, sound and fair-minded judgment, and unquestioned integrity. I could not agree more. Her former colleagues at NBC Universal and Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett describe her as, quote, thoughtful and open-minded, and as someone who, quote, carefully considered every argument without prejudgment and without regard to her personal views. These are exactly the qualities that a federal judge should possess. Ms. Rickleman's professional success would not have been possible without her parents, who I know are proudly watching from home. In the late 1970s, she and her family came to the United States from Ukraine as Jewish refugees seeking freedom and equal opportunity denied to them in the former Soviet Union. Ms. Rickleman's respect for the rule of law and commitment to the Constitution are fueled by her very personal understanding of what it means to live without such protections. I am confident that she will make an exceptional First Circuit judge and I am glad that her husband, Jason, and her daughters are here to support her on this very important day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Warren. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Senator Warren and I are enthusiastically um, endorsing the two candidates for the judiciary who will appear before you today. We selected them uh, together, and uh, we have just great um, confidence in their ability to be superior members of the bench. Uh, Julie Rickleman, nominee to the United States Court of Appeals for the First Cir Circuit, and Judge Margaret Guzman, uh, nominee to the U.S. District Court for the District of Massachusetts. Um, I'll begin with uh, 
Julie Rickleman, who is joined here today, as Senator Warren said, by her husband Jason and their daughters. I know that Ms. Rickleman's parents are proudly watching this hearing at home. Julie Rickleman is an outstanding candidate for the First Circuit. In 1979, when she was just a child, her family emigrated to the United States from the Soviet Union, from Kyiv, Ukraine specifically, settling in Massachusetts. Like so many Soviet emigres, they sought freedom, and especially as Soviet Jews, religious freedom and equal treatment under the law. Ms. Rickleman and her family left behind the only country they ever knew and experienced firsthand the challenges of being refugees and of starting over in a new country with a new language and a new culture, eventually becoming naturalized U.S. citizens. Ms. Rickleman's experience as a Soviet emigre forged and shaped her lifelong commitment to the American legal system and to justice and to the rule of law. Her legal career has been nothing short of stellar. She graduated from Harvard and Harvard Law School. She clerked for the Alaska Supreme Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. She worked as an attorney in private practice and in the public interest, becoming one of the nation's leading reproductive rights attorneys. In the Supreme Court's last term, she argued Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, one of the most important Supreme Court cases in our history. As one of her many colleagues writing on her behalf put it, Julie Rickleman, quote, is brilliant, committed to the rule of law, and deeply devoted to honoring the Constitution and protecting our civil rights and civil liberties. These are precisely the qualities that, should, uh, that we should be looking for in a nominee for a federal appeals court, uh, and we will have them in Julie Rickleman. Uh, she will make an exceptional addition to the First Circuit I look forward to her confirmation. Now, I also want to uh, introduce, along with Senator Warren, Judge Margaret Guzman, who is joined here today by friends, colleagues, and two of her sisters, Amy, <coughs> excuse me, and Catherine. Judge Guzman is a Massachusetts native, a graduate of Clark University in Worcester, and Boston University School of Law. Throughout her career, whether working as a solo practitioner, a public defender, or a Massachusetts state District Court Judge Judge Guzman has exemplified the highest standards of the legal profession. She is a dedicated public servant who will bring knowledge, experience, and compassion to the Massachusetts Federal District Court. In 1999, uh, as Senator Warren said, Judge Guzman became the guardian and custodian to six of her nieces and nephews, then aged 13 to 15. That challenging personal experience has helped her understand and appreciate the difficult circumstances that many justice-involved individuals face in our country. She has worked hard to ensure that all those who must navigate our judicial system, especially the indigent and marginalized, are always treated fairly and with respect. The numerous letters that our offices received in support of Judge Guzman's nomination describe her as having earned the respect of both her colleagues and her adversaries for her consistent work as an ethical and committed advocate for her devotion to the community in which she has spent her entire life. She has done the job. She has provided the service on the state bench as a judge uh, with the highest of integrity to prepare herself for this day. In line with the Biden administration's commitment that the nation's courts reflect the diversity of our country, Judge Guzman, when confirmed, will be the first Hispanic judge to ever have served in the Massachusetts District Court for the District of Massachusetts. She will be a trailblazer and one who leaves me with no doubt that she will serve the people of Massachusetts with distinction as a federal district court judge. I look forward to her confirmation as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for joining us, Senator Markey. And now, Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm pleased to introduce to Aracel Martinez Olguin, uh, who has been nominated to serve as a United States District Judge for the Northern District of California. She's an experienced attorney whom I believe will make an excellent addition to the federal bench. She and her family immigrated to the United States when she was three. Before becoming a lawyer, she taught bilingual kindergarten through Teach for America in Oakland, California. 
She went on to earn her law degree from the University of California Berkeley School of Law and served as a federal district law clerk. She has spent most of her legal career as a public interest attorney, advancing the rights of immigrants and women. In 2006, she joined the staff of the American Civil Liberties Union, where she worked on federal civil rights cases, representing low-income women, immigrant women, and women of color. She later joined the Office of Civil Rights at the United States Department of Education. And since 2018, she's worked for the National Immigration Law Center, where she currently serves as a supervising attorney. Throughout her career, she's demonstrated a commitment to representing the legal rights of some of our nation's most at-risk communities, including survivors of gender-based violence and human trafficking. If confirmed, I believe she's going to continue to demonstrate that commitment to equal justice under the law for everyone. So I'm very pleased the committee is considering her, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Senator Padilla. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to uh, uh, add some uh, thoughts and remarks to Senator Feinstein's introduction, it's also my pleasure to introduce Araceli Martinez Olguin, uh, President Biden's nominee to serve on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California. Uh, Ms. Martinez Olguin is joined here today by her mother Rosa, I understand, along with her spouse Brian and her daughter. And I know that there's many, many more family and friends watching remotely, sending their love and support. You know, Mr. Uh, Chair, from the moment that President Biden entered office, he set out to nominate judicial nominees with a diverse range of both legal and life experience. And Senator Feinstein have been working very closely together to help with that effort. With Ms. Martinez Olguin, we are once again fulfilling our commitment and putting forth the very best that the great state of California and frankly our country have to offer. And we're putting forward someone who has spent her entire career advocating for the rights of immigrants, women, and underserved communities. She was raised in Northern California. Ms. Holguin received her bachelor's degree from Princeton University. Uh, as Senator Feinstein mentioned, she returned home to California to work as a kindergarten teacher before attending UC Berkeley School of Law. After clerking for Judge David Briones on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas, she began her legal career representing low-income women, immigrant women, and women of color in employment and education cases at the ACLU Women's Rights Project. And since then, Ms. Martinez Holguin has spent her career representing those who all too often are overlooked by the legal system. That includes Stinsett's community legal service organizations, the Department of Education, and most recently, the National Immigration Law Center. Colleagues, she has litigated at every level of our federal courts and in states across the country, and in doing so has established herself as a respected leader and expert in the legal community. In fact, earlier this year, she was elected to serve as a member of the American Law Institute in recognition of her exemplary work and record of accomplishment in the law. As a judge, I'm confident that she will give each party and litigant before her the same fair and impartial administration of justice that is expected of the federal judiciary. And she'll bring with her the same wisdom and love for the law that has come to define her legal career. Ms. Martinez Olguin is exactly the type of lawyer and exactly the type of person we should be seeking to elevate to the federal bench and her decency, experience, and commitment to justice will serve the people of the Northern District well. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting her nomination. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Next, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me um, also thank you. We talk a lot about how many judges this committee is um, <clears throat> taking through the process, and obviously uh, some of the president's nominees from both Massachusetts and California sound like they are Great nominees. Uh, we're going to add from Virginia a, a, uh, an additional nominee, an outstanding public servant, uh, Mr. Jamar Walker, 
who is the president's nominee to the, uh, the U.S. District Court Judge for the Eastern District of Virginia. Now, Jamar is joined today by a, uh, a solid group of family and friends, his spouse, Javier de Diego, his mother-in-law, uh, Juanina de Diego, his dear friend, Ashley, his godson, Yavi, his brother, Dwayne Walker, his nephew, Kentrell Walker. We're also happy to have Jamar's mom, Brenda White, and his stepfather, uh, Reverend Willie White Sr. I hope with that many family and friends here, the committee will treat him gently. Um, for the last decade, Jamar has served as an invaluable asset to both Virginia's legal community, bringing both his zeal for public service and an extraordinary personal life story. He was born and grew up on uh, Virginia's Eastern Shore, which is, uh, as, as Senator Kane and I both being former governors, is often a forgotten part of Virginia. It's disconnected from the, the balance of the Commonwealth. It's that little sliver of land uh, on the east. It's very rural. Um, not a lot of folks from the Eastern Shore make it to a U.S. judgeship. Um, but Jamar, I think, uh, brings that unique story. He, he went to UVA both undergrad and at law school, where he was a national champion in the American Mock Trial Association competitions. Uh, following law school, Jamar uh, began his public service career by clerking for uh, Raymond Jackson, the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. And as kind of the wheel of fortune turns, uh, this seat he's up for is actually the, the very same seat uh, that Judge Jackson had at, at, uh, at one point. Uh, for the past seven years, Jamar has dedicated his professional career in the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, for the Eastern District, where he's become now the Acting Chief of Financial Crimes and Public Corruption Unit. And um, probably one of the indications of his ability to do complex work is he's actually received five FBI service awards uh, for his work in public corru uh, corruption, wire fraud, and bank um, cases. He also has been very active with his uh, um, with University of Virginia, going back a number of times on his own time to help uh, emerging students um, uh, become lawyers as well. I think he's going to be a, a great, great judge. Uh, I strongly urge uh, the committee to support him and look forward to him serve, continuing his service to Virginia and our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Warner. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the committee. It is a great pleasure to be here on behalf of Jamar Walker. I'm also thrilled to be here with uh, my colleague, Senator Warner. He and I met in law school 42 years ago. We didn't meet in the library either. We, we, we met at a party, and upon graduation, I became a lawyer and he became a client. I think he got the better end of the deal, but uh, it's good to be here together, and we work hard to forward good nominees to this committee. Jamar Walker is one such person. As Mark indicated, he was raised uh, by a single mom on the eastern shore of Virginia, Nandua High School. It's a long way from Nandua High School, even just in drive time to get to any federal court. The closest one is the court in Norfolk, where he then, after he went to UVA, served as a law clerk to a fantastic federal judge, Ray Jackson. And I know it's very, very special, as Mark indicated, that he is nominated uh, to hold the post occasioned by Judge Jackson's retirement. And that makes Judge Jackson extremely proud. Um, as Mark indicated, he worked at Covington and Burling for a number of years as an associate. The lawyers there speak so highly of him but had a desire to be a public servant, and so started working in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Virginia. Let me tell you what folks in the EDVA say about Jamar. Uh, first, Judge Jackson. Judge Jackson has written a letter that the committee has, and he says that Jamar Walker, quote, has the intellectual prowess, integrity, and temperament that is fundamental in the position of a federal judge. Um, two of his former bosses, U.S. attorneys in the EDVA, Dana Bente and Zach Terwilliger, who have both been before this committee, um, they both note that uh, Jamar Walker, quote, is a person of unimpeachable character who is known by the bench and bar for his keen intellect, decency, sober judgment, and humility. Uh, the EDVA community is strongly in support of this nominee. And I'll conclude, um, Mr. Chair, just to say this. This is the court where I practiced for 17 years, and it is a... a somewhat distinct court in two ways. One, it is, um, has a reputation around the country as being one of the fastest dockets, the rocket docket. Uh, when you would file a civil case, you would get a trial date within six months, not a year, not two years, not indefinitely. And that was tough for the lawyers, and it's tough for the judges and folks who work in the court, but it's really great for the parties because they don't have to have their lives in sort of suspended animation waiting under a sword of Damocles year after year after year. Um, Jamar is very familiar with this rocket dock and understands that it's good for criminal defendants, good for civil litigants. 
uh, and he's very well suited to this particular unique feature of the court. Second, this is a court that because it includes the Pentagon, many military installations, federal intelligence agencies, it has a very significant docket of cases that have national security sensitivities. Um, and Jamar Walker, as a member of the EDVA prosecution team, at receiving FBI certifications, as Lieutenant Warner mentioned, uh, is very uh, adept and able to handle the somewhat unusual docket in the EDVA. We both recommend him without reservation and are excited that he's here today. Thanks, Senator Kane. Uh, Senator Murray? Well, thank you so much, Senator Durbin, and to all of our committee members. I am really thrilled to be here today to introduce Jamal Whitehead. President Biden's nominee to serve as a district court judge for the Western District of Washington State, and someone I had the honor of recommending for this seat after he was supported by my bipartisan Judicial Selection Committee. As I have said before, Washington State deserves judges who will apply the law fairly and evenly and will ensure that all parties get a fair hearing, and that is exactly what they would get in Mr. Whitehead. After graduating from the University of Washington and Seattle University's School of Law, Mr. Whitehead has built an impressive career fighting for the rights of everyday people, not just the wealthy and powerful. As a litigator, he has defended workers in our home state uh, who have faced discrimination, retaliation, and other violations of their rights. That includes over 10,000 people who had been detained over the years at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma and then paid only a dollar a day for working at that facility. Mr. Whitehead served as counsel and secured a jury verdict of $17.3 million in back pay from the company that was operating that detention center. Mr. Whitehead also had years of public service experience as a federal trial attorney with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Western District of Washington. He has established himself as a pillar in the Washington State legal community, community earning the respect and trust of lawyers, judges, his clients, his peers, and so many others in Seattle and across our state. Beyond his impeccable resume defending workers, Mr. Whitehead will also bring to the bench a critical perspective that is severely lacking on our courts. And that's so important to me because I've said time and again, our federal bench should reflect the diversity and experiences of the communities they serve. And that absolutely includes the millions of Americans across the country who have a disability. I know this is an incredibly meaningful moment today for so many people with disabilities because Mr. Whitehead is the first Biden nominee to the federal bench with a disability and his confirmation ensures we have an inclusive federal judiciary. Anyone, some, anytime someone enters a courtroom, they should have the full confidence knowing that their judge before them will issue a decision without partiality, discrimination, or any hint of bias. That is so critical when many people already struggle today to trust our legal system. Building faith in our public institutions can only happen when we have both well-qualified and diverse voices leading the way. Mr. Whitehead made clear to me that this was a priority for him, saying he wants to be, quote, a fair, impartial judge who makes people not just feel heard, but to ensure that they are heard. That should be the goal of all of our judges. And it's one I have no doubt Mr. Whitehead will work hard and successfully to achieve. So I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of his confirmation. And I say to Mr. Whitehead today, You've made all of Washington State very, very proud. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Murray. And of course, Senator Cantwell supports your remarks. Uh, conflict in schedule, she couldn't personally be here, but she's submitted a statement for a record. And I thank all of my colleagues for coming and speaking on behalf of the nominees. So our first panel will consist of the two circuit court nominees, Justice Maria Kahn and Julie Rickleman. The staff will set up the uh, table and you can Get ready to approach it for the oath.
please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that both nominees have answered in the affirmative, which makes the next step easier. And let me first recognize uh, Justice Khan. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and all the members of the committee for holding this hearing. I want to thank President Biden for the great honor of this nomination. I also want to thank my home state senators, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Murphy, for their support throughout this process, and Senator Blumenthal especially for his kind introduction. I have been blessed with the support of family. Although my parents could not be here, they are proudly watching from home. They made countless sacrifices for my brother and me and instilled in us the value of education and hard work. When we immigrated to the United States, I was 10 years old. None of us could have imagined that one day I would be before this committee as a nominee to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. This could only happen in this great nation. I want to acknowledge and thank my husband an accomplished and compassionate physician who is also my best friend. He is here with our daughters. Both have chosen careers in public service and I am so proud of their own accomplishments. Also with me today are my brother Roy, his wife Liz, and two of my nephews Christian and Matthew and my incredible permanent law clerk Adam. Watching from home are my mother-in-law Ruth our son-in-law, Andrew, and the extended Khan and Arujo families throughout the United States and abroad, as well as scores of current and former colleagues, friends, members of our congregation, and members of the broader Portuguese American community. I thank them all for their support. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the many mentors and colleagues that have helped me throughout my legal career. Without them, I would not be here before you. From the late Judge Peter Dorsey, who I clerked for in Federal District Court in Connecticut, to all the federal judges, U.S. attorneys, federal and state prosecutors, public defenders, members of the bar, my colleagues on the Connecticut courts, my chamber staff, and the entire court family, I thank you all for your guidance and support. I'm honored to be here and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Justice. Ms. Rickleman. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and all the members of the committee for holding this hearing. I want to thank Senators Warren and Markey for their support throughout this process and for their very warm introductions today. And of course, I want to thank President Biden for the honor of this nomination, the greatest honor of my professional life. Although my parents can't be here in person for health reasons and are proudly watching from home, they are the biggest reason why I sit here today. In 1979, my parents immigrated to the United States from the former Soviet Union, bringing me and my sister to Brookline, Massachusetts. They came to escape communism and anti-Semitism, and they chose the United States because of its commitment to the law and individual freedom. After we arrived, we all learned English together as a second language. Over their lives, my parents had to flee their homes to avoid the battles of World War II, grew up under Stalin, and faced discrimination that prevented them from achieving their own dreams. But because they brought us here, my sister and I, and now our four daughters, have never had to flee our homes, have grown up in a democracy, and been able to pursue careers based on our own interests and abilities. I can't thank them enough. Also watching from home are my sister, her husband, my in-laws, nieces and nephews, and many colleagues and mentors. In the room with me, I'm so grateful to have friends from every decade of my life here, including two of my college roommates. And last but not least, right behind me are my husband and daughters. My husband and I met in law school, and 28 years later, we've grown up together. I want to thank him for being a devoted father and for always being by my side, as he is today. And to my daughters, nothing has brought me more joy 
than watching them grow up into the kind, thoughtful, hardworking people they are. I welcome the committee's questions. Thank you very much. Um, point of personal privilege to note that both of our nominees are immigrants to this country. I point that out not because it is the exception, but the achievements of the immigrant population to America have made us what we are today. It is more likely the norm than the exception. And these two nominees uh, certainly fill that uh, description. I'm gonna start with Ms. Rickleman. You have, we have five minute rounds. You have litigated a number of cases across the country, probably none more celebrated or spoken of than the role as lead litigator in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, in which you argued that the Supreme Court should find that a Mississippi law banning abortion after 15 weeks is unconstitutional. In addition, you argued that Roe versus Wade and Casey Planned Parenthood were correctly decided and they should be upheld under the principle of stare decisis. As we know, on June 24th, the Supreme Court disagreed with your argument, held that the Constitution does not confer a right to an abortion, and returned the authority to regulate abortion to the states. Ms. Rickleman, let me ask you a two-part question. You spent half of your career as an advocate, protecting access to reproductive rights for all Americans at the Center for Reproductive Rights but now you have been nominated to set aside your advocacy and serve as a federal judge. First, how do you understand the difference between serving as an advocate and serving as a judge? Thank you so much, Senator, for the chance to address that question. As I mentioned, my parents came here because of this country's commitment to the rule of law, and I became an attorney because I believe deeply in our legal system. I've been part of that legal system for 25 years now, first as a law clerk, and then as an advocate, and so I understand very well the different roles of an advocate and a judge. An advocate presents the best possible arguments on behalf of their clients, and a judge looks at all of the advocate's arguments with an open mind. Throughout my career, I have relied on federal judges around the country to follow the law regardless of their personal views or their previous work experiences. That is the kind of judge I wanted for every single one of my clients, and that is the kind of judge that I would commit to be. Second, while I disagree with the Supreme Court's decision, Dobbs is the law of the land at this moment. So let me ask you, will you apply Dobbs faithfully if you are confirmed to the First Circuit? Yes, Senator, absolutely. I wanna be clear that I will apply Dobbs faithfully. Again, I've relied on federal judges, including circuit court judges, to follow Supreme Court precedent in every single case that comes before them. Our legal system and the rule of law itself depends on lower federal courts following Supreme Court precedent. And as you said, Dobbs is now the law of the land, and I will follow it as I will follow all Supreme Court precedent. Thank you. Justice Kahn, while you were serving as an assistant U.S. attorney on the District of Connecticut, you prosecuted health care fraud and other white collar crime. I want to ask you about a specific case regarding a Ponzi scheme for which you were the lead investigator and prosecutor. In the United States versus Linchak, I don't know if I pronounce that correctly, a former New York University student scammed NYU into luring sophisticated investors into a fraudulent hedge fund they called Daedalus Fund, defrauding them of approximately $11.5 million dollars defendant ultimately pleaded guilty. Tell us about your approach to the investigation and prosecution of that case. Thank you, Chairman uh, Durbin. That was a fascinating case uh, because um, it was, the primary defendant was a 21-year-old um, NYU student who was uh, probably one of the smartest uh, defendants that I uh, ever prosecuted or, or uh, were defended as a public defender, he created a fake investment company and was able to convince the most sophisticated business investors to invest in it. The case started with the use of credit card machines to generate seed money for the investment. And it was uh, highly complex, um, partly because the scheme was ongoing and we were approaching investors who had invested a lot of money in this scheme. Um, the scheme also involved um, the defendant uh, pretending to be 
uh, Turkish royalty and to pledging large amounts of money to NYU. Uh, so we were investigating uh, the following the money or the trail of money to prove the case. Um, so how did how would you uh, reflect on the celebrity of the case, the youth and press attention, and then the responsibility of the judge to uh, work in that environment and still seek justice? It's um, it's difficult when you're working on a high profile case, um, and that one certainly was. Um, it was particularly high profile because the university had. Um, begun construction of a major center uh, in the name of this uh, of the defendant Hakan Yelinchek and um, had not received the funds. And then when we um, arrested uh, Hakan Yelinchek and uh, others uh, in connection with that Ponzi scheme, uh, it drew a lot of attention, particularly in New York City, around this issue. Um, and it, it is, it can be challenging uh, to prosecute a case uh, in, that gets so much attention in the media, but the focus has always been for me on the facts of the case, the law to be applied. Thank you. Now Ranking Member Grassley. Thank you very much. Congratulations to both of you. I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Rick Altman. Uh, according to your questionnaire, you're not admitted to practice in any federal court within the First Circuit, and you were admitted to the Massachusetts Bar only in December. Uh, since law school, how long have you lived in Massachusetts, and how many cases have you been involved in before any federal court in the First Circuit? Thank you, Senator. I moved back to Massachusetts where my parents have lived continuously at the beginning of the pandemic to help take care of them because they're in poor health. Um, it's been very hard for them to leave their home and I wanted to be back and close to them so that I could be available to them during this difficult time. So since I became an attorney after graduating from Harvard Law School, I've lived in Massachusetts for two and a half years. As soon as my work allowed me the flexibility uh, of working in a different location, I moved my entirely, entire family back home to Brookline, Massachusetts, where I started my life in this country. Um, and we're all living there together where my kids are attending public school. Have you... Uh my other part of the question was whether you, how many cases you've been involved in there. I've been involved in a handful of cases, Senator. Um, a criminal case I worked on when I was in law school, and then a number of other cases that have wound their way through the courts in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, in your 2007 law review article, you argued that laws requiring convicted criminals to submit to blood samples for DNA testing can't be justified under the Fourth Amendment. In several states, including California, Louisiana, Virginia, and Texas, law enforcement is permitted to collect DNA samples when someone assaults a police officer or a teacher, stalks somebody, or commits a sex crime. In your view, why wouldn't these laws be permitted by the Fourth Amendment? Thank you, Senator. In the law review article that I believe you're referring to, I was only discussing one exception to Fourth Amendment doctrine called the special needs exception. I was not talking about Fourth Amendment law in general, and under the Supreme Court's precedent for many years, the special needs exception only applies in situations where evidence is not gathered for law enforcement purposes. So that was just the point of my article. Okay, Ms. Khan, uh, when you applied to serve as a Connecticut Supreme Court justice, you were asked whether and I quote, the interpretation of the Constitution must evolve with history, end of quote. You said that, quote, the original intent of the drafters is very important, end of quote. But you also said that you, quote, believe our state and federal Constitution should be interpreted in light of advances and changes in our society and history. So this question, other than amendments to the Constitution, what changes in our society and history should courts consider when interpreting the uh, Constitution? Thank you uh, for uh, that question. Uh, first, I, I want to say that if uh, I should be so fortunate to be uh, confirmed, I would follow Supreme Court precedent and Second Circuit precedent in interpretation of uh, 
in any constitutional uh, interpretation case. When I was responding to that question, Senator, what I was referring to is first the text of the Constitution and the intent of the founders is primary uh, and uh, very important. But we also must recognize that the Constitution is an enduring document and that our forefathers could not have envisioned some of the changes, for example, in technology that would affect Fourth Amendment issues, uh, unreasonable searches and seizures, and that's what I was referring to there. Okay. Ms. Rickwell, in uh, 2018 Huffington Post report, you described crisis pregnancy centers as full clinics and suggested that their goal is, quote, to trick women who are seeking abortions or contraception services into visiting their facilities, end of quote. In 2017 blog, you uh, accused crisis pe pregnancy centers of, quote, perf purposefully misleading women about their mission, end of quote. You obviously have firmly held views on uh, these centers. Will you commit to recusing yourself from cases involving crisis pregnancy centers? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. In those um, articles, I believe I was speaking in my role as an advocate. The only way that I've been involved in litigation relating to pregnancy centers is in defense of consumer protection laws uh, that were enacted based on evidence that some women had felt misled about the types of medical services that were available at the centers. But of course, should I be fortunate enough to be a judge, I will carefully look at the recusal statute and consider all of the circumstances of a case, um, consult with my chief judge, and do absolutely whatever the code of judicial conduct requires. Yeah, Ms. Reckelman, a very short question, Mr. Chairman. If confirmed, will you uh, faithfully follow the Dobbs decision? Absolutely, Senator. I want to assure you that I will faithfully follow Dobbs and all Supreme Court precedent because nothing is more important to me than the rule of law in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Justice Kahn and Ms. Rickleman, uh, early in your legal careers, you both served as law clerks. Justice Kahn, you served as a law clerk for Judge Peter Dorsey in the District of Columbia. And Ms. Reichelman, you served as a law clerk for Justice Dana Fabe on the Alaska Supreme Court and for Judge Morton Greenberg on the Third Circuit. So I view this experience as very valuable uh, for young attorneys to learn about the process of law. So here's the question. Beginning with Justice Kahn, what lessons about judging did you learn from your, those experiences serving as law clerks? And how would you take those lessons with you uh, in your own judicial service if you're elected? Thank Ms. you. Rickman, why don't we begin with you? Thank you so much, Senator. Um, I was so privileged to work for two different appellate judges. Uh, Justice Fabe was the first woman who ever served on the Alaska Supreme Court and became its longest serving Chief Justice, and then for Judge Greenberg, who sadly passed away a short time ago. They were both incredible role models and first supervisors in my legal career. They remained mentors. Uh, I kept in touch with them and spoke with Justice Fabe again just a week ago. They were kind, respectful, hardworking, and cared deeply about the law. And in every single case that I worked with them on, uh, I knew that they looked at the record and the law fairly and impartially, and they became wonderful role models um, and gave me great confidence in our legal system. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Senator. Um, I was very fortunate to clerk for Judge Dorsey, and the lessons I learned from that clerkship carry with me today. Um, lessons of looking at each case with an open mind, listening to the parties, treating everyone, whether it was litigants, uh, uh, lawyers, court staff, everyone um, uh, equally, and uh, reaching decisions based on the law and the facts of each case. I carry those lessons with me. I try to instill those lessons in my own law clerks um, and talk to them about, about my experiences and hope that they will take away from clerking with me those same lessons and uh, experiences. Well, I thank you both for that. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Lee. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to both of you for being here and being willing to be considered. Ms. Reichman, I'd like to start with you, if that's all right. Um, commenting on, uh, on June Medical versus Gee, the Supreme Court's decision in that case, you've said, quote, Louisiana's challenge to third party standing could have sweeping implications for civil rights, not just abortion, shutting the courthouse door to entire classes of people. Uh, what are the limiting principles of third party standing? Thank you so much, Senator. Um, the court has uh, laid out a number of principles for third party standing. One of the major ones that it was at issue in that case is whether the law directly impacts the plaintiff in the case. So in order to assert third party standing on behalf of others, the plaintiff also has to be directly regulated by the law. So what are the sweeping implications that, that uh, June Medical would have for that or that Louisiana's position in that could have? Yes, Senator, I was referring to other circumstances where, um, for, for instance, other medical professionals have brought claims on behalf of their patients, not even uh, concerning reproductive health care, but just other types of health care and what it could mean for those types of cases. Um, so uh, to what other civil rights were you referring when you made that statement? Um, I was speaking, for instance, about contraception, uh, Senator, and... Um, what part of the June medical case or the arguments raised in it would have sweeping implications for contraception? Cases defending the right to contraception, Senator, have also been brought by medical professionals. So if those medical professionals didn't have third parties standing to assert the rights of their patients, it would have impacted those cases as well. That's what I meant. Reacting to the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs, you helped draft the report, uh, a, re a report that carried the title, The Constitutional Right to Reproductive Autonomy, Realizing the Promise of the 14th Amendment. Now, the report characterized the Supreme Court's recent Dobbs decision as, uh, quote, unquote, callous, uh, one which would, according to the report, quote, relegate women to second-class status, uh, uh, representing, according to the report, quote, a cataclysmic retrogression of rights in the United States. And it goes so far as to call the Dobbs decision from the Supreme Court uh, uh, an egregiously wrong one, uh, and it admonishes this... Um, this period, um, uh, it says that this is, this is no time to turn away from the courts. It is a critical moment to insist courts fulfill their roles in ensuring equal justice for all, close quote. Uh, what is it that you think that the courts need to do in order to rectify what you believe was uh, an egregious error in Dobbs? Uh, Senator, um, I contributed to that report with a number of my colleagues and Obviously, I'm not an expert in every single sentence of the report. I think there the report was simply reiterating um, the view of my organization as an advocacy organization that we had argued to the court that the Supreme Court should have retained the previous precedent of 50 years and that um, many people in the country had relied on that precedent for several generations. It, you also said um, that the impact of Dobbs will be, quote, swift and severe. And you insisted, quote, we're on the verge of what may be the biggest public health crisis we have ever seen in decades, close quote. Um, in, a, in a world in which more babies are being born and born alive instead of being aborted, um, would you call that a, a public health crisis? Not just any public health crisis, but the biggest public health crisis that we've seen in decades, or worse than COVID-19? Or what about HIV AIDS? Uh, Tell me, help me understand that. Senator, absolutely. Uh, in that report, which again was an advocacy report on behalf of the organization, we were talking about the implications of forcing women to give birth against their will, not about in the implications for women who want to have a child. So the report is simply discussing... R right, no, I understand that, but you did say it's the biggest public health crisis in decades, did you not? Yes, Senator, what was the report was referring to there, I believe, um, was the fact that the maternal mortality rate is so much higher for women who are forced to continue a pregnancy. Uh, it's 14 times higher, and the uh, maternal mortality rate has significant disparities, so it would have serious public health implications for women who are forced to continue a pregnancy no, but, against their will. But this wasn't an advocacy report. This was, this was your statement, a statement you made to Axios, and you put your name on it, uh, uh, when you were under consideration for judicial consideration. So you, you can't write this one off as something that you did as just as a lawyer. This was you. Uh, Senator, I, 
I believe the statement that you're talking about would have been um, a statement that I made to a reporter in my role as an advocate at the center. And so I was talking about the implications of the Supreme Court's ruling and reiterating arguments I had made to the court. 19 million black babies have been aborted since Roe. And um, I'm sure the, mo the, the number is, is much higher uh, seven years later. That, that was a statistic that was live as of 2015. 36 to 40 percent of abortions are performed on black women, even though black Americans make up fewer than 14 percent of the American population. In New York City, in statistics from several different years, recent years, more black babies have been born, have been aborted than born alive. Uh, and yet, I mean, one could argue that this is, uh, this is a, a grave threat to the African-American population of the United States and to parts of the United States like New York City where very often uh, more babies are being killed through abortion rather than being born alive. You stand by your statement today that this is the greatest public health crisis, that is the Dobbs decision that we faced in decades? Senator, again, I made that statement as an advocate, and as an advocate, I uh, argued for women to be able to make their own personal medical decisions regardless of race. You can't just call, throw out baseless claims and call on advocacy. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, I don't think we've had two more qualified nominees to the federal bench than both of you. Uh, you are both stars in my view and uh, both of you have committed and I believe you sincerely that you will put aside whatever your personal beliefs are and that you will make judgments fairly following precedent and respect for the rule of law. I wanna ask you, uh, Justice Kahn, you've served on an appellate court and our state Supreme Court. So you have really developed a very keen sense of the importance of precedent and following precedent, both sitting on our state's highest court and expecting judges on the Superior Court and the appellate court to follow your rulings. Let me ask you, uh, how would you explain why it's important for lower court judges to follow precedent? Thank you, uh, Senator, for that question. Um, I think it's essential for um, lower courts, for um, courts that are bound by precedent to follow precedent. I think uh, our system of justice depends on the rule of law. I think following precedent provides consistency um, predictability so that litigants and um, parties know what the law is and what they can expect um, in the various areas. So I think following precedent is uh, very important, uh, critical to the rule of law, and I believe my record as a judge uh, will show that I have applied precedent faithfully um, and that we, I would continue to do so if I were fortunate to be um, confirmed. Uh, Ms. Rickleman, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to say hello earlier, but welcome. Um, you have been uh, in the course of your career really one of our nation's most active and able litigators, and you have performed the role of advocate with such great skill I wonder whether y what you would say to this panel about your ability to put aside that part of your life where you have excelled and to go to another life where in effect you will be applying precedent and respecting the rule of law to follow the United States Supreme Court even when you disagree with it. Thank you so much for that question, Senator. Yes, I've been an advocate for many years now, several decades, and what I will say is, as an advocate, on behalf of every single one of my clients, regardless of the case or the claims, 
All I wanted from the federal judges before whom I appeared was for them to be fair and impartial and to follow the law. In fact, my advocacy always relied on federal judges following Supreme Court precedent in every case, and that is absolutely what our legal system requires. The rule of law would not be possible without it. My family came to this country because of the rule of law. I understand what it's like based on that experience to not have faith in a government institution. So I can pledge to this committee that I will faithfully follow all Supreme Court precedent and that every litigant, every attorney that comes before me um, will find a fair, open-minded judge who will follow the law. And as an advocate, your role was, and your responsibility was to argue as zealously and ardently as you possibly could to state positions that would advance the interests of your client. Uh, in your case, your client often was one of public interest. Uh, that is very different from what you will, you will be doing as a judge and working with colleagues to reach a common consensus on what the outcome of the case will be. Absolutely, Senator. In fact, um, I've represented a wide range of clients from corporations to small businesses to individuals and for every single one of them, I did my absolute best to research the law and the facts and present the best possible arguments to support them. As a judge, I will have a very different role. I understand that role because I always wanted to appear in front of fair, open-minded judges who would follow the law. Nothing is more important to me than the rule of law and I pledge that I will follow it. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Thank you Blackburn. very much, Mr. Chairman. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to each of you on your nomination. Um, Ms. Reichelman, I want to come to you again on the DNA question and uh, your answer to Senator Grassley on that. Um, one of the things we've talked about a good bit lately is the need for rape kit processing and the importance of that in getting violent offenders, uh, perpetrators off the streets. So um, I, I think you're trying to kind of work around the constitutionality issue of this. To me, your answer is a little bit fuzzy uh, your comments, your writing in the past, has been something that would lead me to ascertain that you support the criminal instead of in, uh, supporting the victim. So I would like to hear from you. Uh, in this regard, do you believe DNA testing is unconstitutional? Or do you accept the court's determination that the Fourth Amendment permits states to obtain DNA from these violent perpetrators and criminals? Thank you, Senator. I absolutely accept the court's interpretation. I will follow all Supreme Court precedent on the Fourth Amendment, uh, and I understand how critical it is for law enforcement to be able to obtain evidence that they need in um, making sure that they are doing everything they can to keep us safe. What would have led you then in 2007 in that law review article to look at taking DNA as being unconstitutional. Senator, in that article, I was writing only about a very narrow part of Fourth Amendment doctrine, um, something called the special needs I, exception. I realize that. Uh, but to look at that and then to think about how important DNA is in making these determinations and getting those tests back to local law enforcement so that they can apprehend these individuals that are violent criminals. This makes me really uneasy when I read that and then I hear your answer and I feel as if you're wanting to nuance where you are on that, that issue. We have a terrible crime issue in this country. We have seen it in city after city. 
In my state, in Memphis, it has been heartbreaking to see the crime that has played out there. We've seen an uptick in crime in the Nashville area. And it is going to be important that this nation return to a tough on crime posture. Uh, it is going to be important that we get these violent criminals off the street. So I, that does cause me a little bit of concern. I'm also concerned about what I see, and I know Senator Grassley talked with you about this, um, really the lack of a significant connection to the court uh, to which you would have a lifetime appointment to. Uh, currently, you're not even admitted to practice before the First Circuit. And you were only admitted to the Massachusetts Bar in December. Did you do that in order to be nominated for a judgeship? No, Senator, absolutely not. I grew up in Massachusetts and spent more than 20 years of my life living there. I moved back to Massachusetts during the pandemic shortly after it began to take care of my parents mm -hmm. who've lived there continuously because they're in poor health. And I wanted to be able to be close to them and able to help them on a weekly basis. And that's when I moved back and then became a member of the Massachusetts Bar. Okay. All right. Uh, Justice Khan. Um, Let's talk about legislative history. And when you are making decisions and you're looking at a statutory provision trying to determine what it means, what role does legislative history play in your decision? Thank you, Senator, uh, for that question. Um, it's different in uh, the state of Connecticut versus federal court. So our state legislature passed a statute that mandates us to look at legislative history. But as a federal judge, I understand that my role in interpreting uh, uh, statutes would first and foremost start with the language the text of the statute. If that's clear, the inquiry ends there. If um, the statute is not clear, then I would look at the, uh, uh, rely on rules or the canons of statutory construction, uh, perhaps look at, um, obviously follow precedent if it's already been interpreted. The Constitution, does that weigh in for you? Uh, with regard to questions of constitutional interpretation, I would follow Supreme Court precedent and Second Circuit precedent as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Um, welcome to you both. Uh, I look forward to supporting your nominations and particularly uh, Ms. Rickleman, for you, um, as a nominee to the First Circuit, which Rhode Island uh, is in, and I'm uh, very happy that um, you'll be preceded to the court by uh, Lara Montecalvo, who is a terrific Rhode Island lawyer and who cleared the Senate floor thanks to the leadership of uh, Chairman Durbin um, not too long ago. Um, I've argued frequently before the First Circuit and um, I'm just delighted that uh, you're nominated to that court. Um, I think it's impressive that the uh, Jackson Health Center went all the way to Massachusetts to find you. It suggests that you have an excellent reputation as a lawyer and particularly as an appellate lawyer. And as the case developed, um, it is not unusual for lawyers to be spun off as you get towards the Supreme Court so that experienced Supreme Court practitioners can take over. And the fact that um, you were uh, the um, lead advocate in the court, I think also says an enormous amount about how your clients and colleagues uh, respect your experience. Um, is there anything about the way I've described the prominent role uh, that you had in that case um, that I've missed, but it seems to me that that's an actual credential in terms of um, colleagues and clients knowing that you were a good person to go to in a tough case that was sure to be hard fought 
and uh, to see it through to argument in the Supreme Court. Yes, thank you so much, Senator. I deeply appreciate uh, my clients and the support of my organization to give me the opportunity to argue at the Supreme Court. It is always a privilege to be able to argue at the highest court in our land. And um, this is not appropriate for you to respond to, but I can't help but comment that um, in this committee, we saw justice after justice come through here and say how much they respected precedent when they were asked about Roe versus Wade, casting a very, very clear signal that they would, in fact, respect precedent uh, regarding Roe versus Wade. And it took them, like, minutes, I'm exaggerating, once they got a 6-3 majority and knew they could win the vote to stuff through the Dobbs opinion, uh, I think for the first time in American history, actually taking a right that had been established for half a century away from people. Um, you are not in a position to comment on that, I know, and certainly not as a nominee to the First Circuit. Uh, but as long as we're talking about that case, um, I think that background is important to know. And I guess we'll hear in a bit what Justice Roberts' investigation into the leak of Justice Alito's opinion reveals. Um, so I'm not going to predict what it will reveal. Um, but I'm delighted that uh, the Chief Justice took the opportunity to investigate that question. And I hope he is um, equally attentive to investigating questions about um, whether Justice Thomas should have recused himself either in this case, or in the cases involving the insurrection investigation, uh, there are simple fact questions that would help define whether or not Justice Thomas should, in fact, have recused himself. And as long as the Chief Justice is capable of investigating fact matters, like who leaked the Alito draft, um, I think the question of what Justice Thomas knew and when he knew it equally lends itself to factual investigation. And um, I hope he will discharge that responsibility, particularly while he's seeking to assert that the court and only the court has anything to say about the ethics well known of uh, its members. And my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, congratulations to the nominees. Thank you for being here. Ms. Ruckelman, can I start with you? In 2018, the day after the Supreme Court ruled that California couldn't force pro-life pregnancy centers, resource centers, to advertise on behalf of abortion clinics, you wrote an interesting op-ed in the Huffington Post. I have it right here. You said in this op-ed, that pregnancy resource centers are nothing but faux clinics, that's your word, that pose as real medical facilities. Do you, you remember writing this? I, I don't remember that particular article, Senator, but I take your word for it. You, you don't, it was 2018, you don't remember writing it? Just not that particular article, but I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have about it. Well, let me just ask what you meant by faux clinics. Do you stand by that, that pregnancy resource centers are faux clinics that pose as medical facilities? Faux means fake, of course, so you're saying that they're fake clinics? Uh, Senator, I believe the case that you're referring to is the Nifla versus Becerra case, and um, I was involved in that case as an advocate on behalf of Amiki, and the case concerned a California law that was a, a consumer protection law that was enacted after some women reported that they felt misled about the types of services that were available at the centers, and that's all that I was referring to there. Well, no, I'm asking about your, your comments that pregnancy resource centers are faux clinics. We have had representatives from pregnancy resource centers here before this committee testifying under oath 
who testified that at their centers they employ trained, licensed medical professionals. So is your, is your testimony here that these folks are lying under oath, that, they're, that that's not the case, that these centers are all fake? Absolutely not, Senator. Again, I was just referring to um, the amicus brief that I'd written as an advocate in that case, which shared stories of women from California who had gone to some pregnancy centers without understanding that they didn't provide any medical services at that particular center. Well, how about this? Is an ultrasound a legitimate medical procedure in your view? Of course, Senator. Okay. So countless pregnancy resource centers provide ultrasounds. Those are medical Procedures. Ultrasounds allow fatal abnormal fetal ab abnormalities to be diagnosed and treated early on. So surely those aren't faux clinics. Uh, in another article, you said that these clinics cause women to suffer concrete harms to their health. Um, it, that's just confusing to me. I mean, these clinics, and there are thousands of them across the country, including in my home state of Missouri, provide free pregnancy tests, free ultrasounds, free prenatal care, free adoption care, free diapers, free clothes, free car seats. Many of them even provide free job training. And yet you're saying that they're faux clinics. Senator, I absolutely support all parents having the resources they need. In that article, I was merely speaking as an advocate about the particular law that had just been um, evaluated by the Supreme Court, which was a consumer protection law in response to some women who had felt misled by well, some centers. You were using the Supreme Court's decision as an opportunity to tarnish and to go after pregnancy resource centers, which is frankly something we've seen from our, our friends here on the left who would like to eliminate these pregnancy resource centers and shut them down all across the country. They're very open about that. I'm just trying to figure out, is that your view too? Would you like to see these pregnancy resource centers that provide this free medical care to women shut down across the country so that free medical care for women is no longer available? Uh, Senator, once again, I was just speaking about one particular law uh, in California that was enacted as a consumer protection law just to make sure that all women could have whatever information they needed to make the best decisions for themselves. That's well, all that I was speaking about. Let me ask you about the Supreme Court's decision in the 2007 case, Gonzalez versus Carhartt. You're familiar with that case, I assume. Yes, I know that case. Um, let me just read briefly from the case. Dr. Haskell went in with forceps and grabbed the baby's legs and pulled them down into the birth canal. Then he delivered the baby's body and arms, everything but the head. Then the doctor stuck the scissors into the back of his head and the baby's arms jerked out. The doctor opened up the scissors, stuck a high-powered suction tube into the opening, and sucked the baby's brains out. That's partial birth abortion. Congress banned this procedure by a bipartisan majority in, majority in 2003. Do you think Congress made the right call there? Senator, uh, what I know is that the Supreme Court upheld that act, I believe about 15 years ago, and it's been settled law in the country for all of that time. And of course, I will faithfully follow it if I were so fortunate as to become a judge. Well, I'm asking because in 2019, news outlet, no, outlet in Oklahoma quoted you saying you oppose any attempt to regulate abortion procedures. The article says that you opposed an, an Oklahoma state law that, quote, bans dismemberment abortions. And it quotes a public statement you released saying, we cannot overstate the harm this decision will have on women in Oklahoma. Politicians should never take medical options off the table for pregnant patients. So you're against bans on partial birth abortion. No, Senator. The law has been settled there for 15 years. And just to be clear, all of the work that I did as an advocate was within the confines of Supreme Court precedent, which allowed states to impose limits on abortion, but also recognized that women should be able to make their own personal medical decisions. Well, my time has expired. I know there are other senators who, who want to ask questions, so I will uh, return, the, uh, return the floor to the chairman. I just want to say in conclusion, Ms. Rickleman, that I have to say that your characterization of pregnancy centers your opposition to, frankly, radical pro-abortion laws, um, I, I think are, are, are very, very troubling. And it gives me grave concern about your nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have two judicial nominees who are immigrants. And as far as I'm concerned, once again, Mr. Chairman, highlighting the contributions that immigrants have made and continue to make to our country. I welcome both of you and your families. I ask the following two initial questions of all nominees before any of the committees on which I sit to ensure the fitness of the nominees for the positions that you seek. 
Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? I have not. Thank you. No, Senator. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No, Senator. No, Senator. Thank you. I would just like to note that regarding the pregnancy resource or uh, pregnancy crisis centers, it's a huge question whether or not they have to uh, comply with, the, with HIPAA, which ensures that privacy data remains private. There's a question as to that relating to these kinds of centers because they accumulate millions of pieces of information from the thousands, the thousands of women mainly who uh, go to these centers and we don't know what happens, what these centers do with this information, and especially as there are states such as Texas that uh, make it illegal to, uh, to help women who want to seek abortion. You know, there's a, there's a question as to the privacy of the, of the masses of uh, data that is collected by these centers, and that's why I just want to mention uh, that uh, my bill, my body, my data is really important to make sure that these centers do not misuse uh, this data. Huge question in my mind about whether that is actually happening. Both of you mentioned that, uh, of course, you would follow precedent. And yes, we have had uh, Trump nominees who assured us that they would follow precedent. Frankly, the only people who can change precedent are the justices of the Supreme Court, and they are very busy doing that. Everybody else has to follow precedent as both of you have testified, regardless of the positions and articles and uh, uh, things that you've, uh, advocacy that uh, you have uh, taken in the past. So let me just ask a pretty fundamental question. Why is it important for circuit court and other lower court judges to follow Supreme Court precedent? Let's start with you. Thank you so much, Senator. It is critical for all lower federal court judges to follow the Supreme Court's precedent. As it's often said, vertical stare decisis is absolute. Uh, the rule of law, our legal system, just wouldn't work if federal court judges, including circuit court judges, didn't follow Supreme Court precedent. Um, the Supreme Court has said that precedent is part of the rule of law. It's integral to the rule of law. And I would absolutely commit to following all Supreme Court precedent in every case, on every claim, if I were fortunate enough to be a judge. Justice Kahn. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I also agree that uh, following precedent is critical to um, our system of justice, to upholding the rule of law, to ensuring consistency and predictability um, in our courts. And if fortunate enough to be confirmed, I would follow faithfully all Supreme Court precedent and precedent in the Second Circuit. I think both of you have testified, and I am um, maybe paraphrasing a little bit, but both of you respect the rule of law, and that um, what you would seek in any judge is an uh, ability to be fair and objective and uh, someone who follows the law. That's all I seek when I am confronted by nominees. Both of you are immigrants. Can you just um, share with us and what being an immigrant has, uh, uh, what kind of effect or influence being an immigrant has had on your life choices? I can start with you. Thank you so much, Senator. Richmond. Yes. Um, it, you know, being an immigrant has given me firsthand experience with um, the fact that you know, many people live around the world in places where they don't trust government institutions. And my parents came here to escape communism and anti-Semitism anti because of this country's commitment to the rule of law. And so nothing is more important to me than that. And I think it was because of those experiences as a child that I became interested in issues of justice. And I became an attorney. I wanted to be an attorney because I believe so deeply in our justice system, in the promise of equal justice for all. And I I am just so honored to be here today, and there would be no greater honor than to serve my country and uphold the rule of law here. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, too, am grateful that my parents chose to come to the United States because of our democracy, because they knew this was a place my brother and I could get an education, and if we worked hard, um, who knew I might be here uh, someday, and I'm grateful to them for that. 
my experience as an immigrant encouraged me into a life of public service and to ensuring that I played a role in equal justice. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, because as an immigrant myself, um, that kind of background certainly has influenced my desire to give back to a country that gave me opportunities that I would never otherwise have had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rono. Senator Cruz? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joe Biden is attempting to fundamentally change our judiciary. Biden has decided, with the complicity of Senate Democrats, to abandon the notion of fair and impartial judges who apply the law, and instead to fill the bench with partisan zealots. Ms. Rickleman, unfortunately, I look at your career, and I see that it embodies precisely this pattern. You have spent the majority of your professional life as an extreme zealot advocating for abortion. That is clearly a heartfelt and personal passion of you. It is a passion you've decided to devote your life to. But it is not remotely within the mainstream. Your views on abortion are not middle of the road. They're not views that most people in their typical lives encounter. You believe, for example, that abortion ought to be entirely legal right up until the moment of birth, including the ninth month of pregnancy. Is that correct? No, Senator. As an advocate, I always worked within Supreme Court precedent, which only permitted okay, abortion no, 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 until I, I, viability. You believe, I didn't ask what the law was, I asked what your belief was. You believe that abortion should be legal up until the moment of birth, including in the ninth month. Senator, that's not an, a position I ever took as an advocate. What do I, you believe? My personal views will not impact I, any of my decisions. Are you willing to judgment. answer the question? I understand, I, I watched you answer Senator Hawley, and you said, oh, I didn't say that there, I didn't say that there. What do you believe? Senator, the work that I did at the center was to protect women's okay, ability. Let me try it again. Do you believe abortion should be legal in the ninth month of pregnancy? Senator, all of my work has so been to protect. So you refuse to answer the question. I'm not asking about your work. It's a very simple question. Do you believe it should be legal in the ninth month of pregnancy? Senator, my personal views do not okay, matter. Okay, so you're refusing to answer. All right, let's try something else. Do you believe crisis pregnancy centers are a good thing or a bad thing? Senator, again, my personal views okay, you're won't refusing matter. to answer that question also. So that's exactly what a zealot would do. They won't tell this committee. They won't tell the American people. The reason you won't answer, I believe, that you advocate unlimited abortion in the ninth month of pregnancy is because you know 91% of Americans disagree with you. Tens of millions of Americans who consider themselves pro-choice say, that is crazy to abort a child in the ninth month of pregnancy, and you've spent your entire life fighting for that. Let's take crisis pregnancy centers. You're nominated for the First Circuit. That means you interviewed with Senator Elizabeth Warren, and you got her support. Now, you have very, very few connections to the First Circuit. You've been in New York and Alaska much of your career. Senator Warren has said, quote, with Roe gone, it's more important than ever to crack down on so-called crisis pregnancy centers that mislead and deceive patients seeking abortion care. Do you agree with Senator Warren? Senator, as an advocate, I only worked on cases I, about- I didn't ask what you have advocated for. I asked, do you agree with Senator Warren? At Senator, under the Code of Judicial Conduct, which applies to nominees, I'm not allowed to share personal you have, views. You're not allowed, judicial nominees are not allowed to have any personal views on any issues of public policy. Is that, that your testimony to this committee? The Code of Judicial Conduct does specifically say that it would be inappropriate to share any personal views as a nominee because it would suggest that I could prejudge issues. And so, so Senator Warren has filed legislation that would shut down crisis pregnancy centers all across the country denying women care that they need and want. Do you agree with that legislation? Senator, all of my advocacy I, has been to help Again, women make you're not answering my question. Do you agree with that legislation? Senator, it would be inappropriate for me to 
comment on have you, pending have legislation. Have you seen that legislation? I have not, Senator. Have you discussed that legislation with Senator Warren or her staff? No, absolutely not. So let me ask another question. As you know, the Dobbs opinion was leaked. It's one of the greatest violations of trust in the Supreme Court in the history of this nation. Do you have any knowledge whatsoever as to the identity of the leaker? Absolutely not, Senator, and as a former law clerk to an appellate judge, um, I understand how critical confidentiality is for judges and their law clerks. You wrote a law review article advocating against DNA testing for convicted criminals, for convicted murderers, convicted rapists, convicted pedophiles. The view you advocated has been rejected by the Supreme Court. It's not good law. Do you still maintain your belief then that it was unconstitutional to take the DNA of convicted murderers, rapists, and pedophiles? Senator, the Supreme Court has determined that issue, and I will faithfully follow the Supreme Court's decision as I will follow all of their it. decisions. It, it, it does not matter if I agree with the Supreme but, Court's decision. But do you agree? I, I get to decide if it matters. You, you, you get to decide how to answer the question. Do you agree with the decision? Senator, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on So there's Supreme literally decision. nothing you're going to answer. Thank you. Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Colleagues, let's uh, be clear. It's last June, in the Dobbs case, the Supreme Court overturned a half a century of settled precedent when they overturned Roe v. Wade. In the months that have followed, we've already started seeing the horrific consequences of that decision. Women, across many, many states, facing difficulty accessing potentially life-saving care. Girls being told that they should be willing to carry forced pregnancies to term. People being told that they do not have the agency or choice in making basic reproductive decisions for themselves and their families. Now, Ms. Reckleman, who appears before us today, of course, argued before the Supreme Court that the justices should not discard the decades of precedent upholding the right to an abortion. Actually, many of those justices who sat before this committee as part of their confirmation hearing, when asked, when pressed, responded to Roe being a matter of settled law. But Ms. Reichelman, who sits before us, has said that her prior advocacy won't play a role in her new role as a judge and that she will faithfully apply precedent regardless of her prior advocacy in that case or related ones. So I'm certain that she understands the difference between the role of a judge and the role of an advocate or a policymaker. She has responded just as all members of the committee, both sides of the aisle, would want her to. Now, what I am less certain of is that the Republican appointed justices of the Supreme Court understand that distinction. In major case after major case, their view of the law has tended to conveniently align with the Republican Party platform, whether in the context of abortion rights, gun safety, labor protections, environmental protection, and so much more. Each term, we're seeing an increased politicized Supreme Court, and I hope my colleagues who argue so forcefully in this committee that there should be a separation between law and policy will train their gaze on the place where that distinction is being muddled the most. Sorry, the distinction between law and politics should train their gaze on the place where the distinction is muddled the most, and that is the Supreme Court. Now, with that being said, in my time remaining, I do have one question. Welcome. Uh, now, outside of your work for the Center for Reproductive Rights, you've had an entire career of practicing law. 
in private practice and in-house at NBC Universal, that's been referenced earlier in the hearing. Can you describe what you've learned about the law in those other phases of your legal career and how you'll also bring those experiences with you to the bench? Thank you so much, Senator, for that question. Yes, I've actually spent half of my career in private practice. I worked for a small firm, a large firm, and in-house at NBC. And so over the course of my career, I've represented a wide range of clients, major corporations, small businesses, individuals. And for each and every one of my clients, I strove to do the absolute best that I could do. And I think that shows that I can approach the law from many different perspectives. And what I've learned over all of those years of practice is just how important it is to do careful legal analysis, careful factual analysis. And for every client that I represented, no matter what type of case it was, all I wanted from a federal judge was for that judge to be open-minded, fair, and impartial, and that's exactly the kind of judge that I would be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Cotton. Ms. Rockleman, do we have a violent crime crisis in America today? I'm sorry, Senator. Do we have a violent crime crisis in America today? Uh, Senator, uh, I would leave that up to policymakers to decide. Okay, I would say we do, since murders have increased so much in the last few years. They're now up to levels not seen since the 1990s, in part because of left-wing pro-criminal policies, like the ones you advocated for in your 2007 article in the Baylor Law Review, where you argued it was unconstitutional for law enforcement to log DNA samples from convicted criminals. Uh, I know you discussed this a few minutes ago with Senator Grassley, I was watching. Uh, I was astonished at what I saw. Uh, you claim that you were only talking about one exception to the Fourth Amendment and not the Fourth Amendment in general. That is not true. Here's what you said to Senator Grassley. This is what, just moments ago. In the law review article that I believe you're referring to, I was only discussing one exception to Fourth Amendment doctrine called the special needs exception. I was not talking about Fourth Amendment law in general. You just said the same thing to Senator Blackburn as well. Twice now you've claimed you're only talking about the special needs exception. But here's your own words in the Baylor Law Review article. The question remains whether the court will uphold the DNA testing statutes under a theory other than the special needs exception. Current precedent does not support the DNA testing statutes under any Fourth Amendment theory. However, given that every federal appellate court that has considered the statutes has found them constitutional, it is more likely than not the Supreme Court will do the same. This article predicts that should the court uphold the DNA testing schemes, it will rely on its line of cases establishing a diminished expectation of privacy for prisoners and those on probation or supervised release. Under this standard, the court should refuse to uphold the statutes as applied to arrestees as opposed to convicted felons. The court should not uphold the DNA testing statutes under any Fourth Amendment theory. So what you said earlier, Senator Grassley, I don't think was a nuanced difference on the understanding of the law. You said that you were not talking about anything in the article other than the special needs exception, but your article tells clearly a different story. Would you like to revise your answer earlier? Uh, Senator, I apologize if I forgot the end of the article. I wrote it, I think, about 15 years ago. My memory of the article was that it focused, and I think its title focused, on the special needs exception to the Fourth Amendment, which is an issue that I had litigated a few years earlier. Um, and therefore, my memory of it is that the bulk of it discusses that narrow exception to the Fourth Amendment, which is supposed to be invoked under Supreme Court precedent only in situations when the evidence isn't gathered for law enforcement purposes. Ms. Rockleman, you're nominated for a lifetime position on a court one step below the Supreme Court. Did you not review your own writings in preparation for this testimony? Uh, Senator, I, I did look at that article briefly. Again, I wrote it 15 years ago, um, and my memory of it, including its title, is that it really focused on the special needs exception. Again, I just want to be clear to the committee that I will faithfully follow all Supreme Court precedent, whether it's on the Fourth Amendment or any other part of our law. I, I know you wrote it 15 years ago, but you said you looked at it, albeit briefly. I mean, again, this is a lifetime position on a court one step below the Supreme Court. I mean, I, I think we have a reason to expect you take more care than to review your own record briefly. When litigants come before you, are, gonna, are you going to read their papers briefly or carefully? 
I will read them extremely carefully and carefully look up all of the relevant precedent and the record that is in the case. Let me get to the substance of this argument itself. Um, do you know what percent of convicted criminals are rearrested in the United States? I do not, Senator. It's almost all of them. 83% are rearrested within the first nine years after they've been released from prison. Do you still think it should be illegal to check a convicted rapist's DNA to see if he's, I don't know, raped another woman or committed a murder? Senator, I think the Supreme Court has resolved the issue, and I will faithfully follow the Supreme Court's precedent in any criminal case that may come before me, but and I understand. You, you maintain the same personal view that you wrote about in the 2007 Baylor Law Review article and that you misrepresented here today, that we should not take DNA samples of convicted murderers and rapists to see if we can close out other cases or to use in investigations in the future when they almost certainly commit other heinous crimes. Senator, in that article, I was merely discussing uh, Supreme Court precedent and how it should be applied. That's the only question that I was looking at there. It was not meant to be um, a discussion of policy, which I leave to uh, folks in your position. And again, I will faithfully apply all Supreme Court precedent, whether it's on the Fourth Amendment or any other area of law. Well, the folks in my position, at least on the other side, aren't doing a very good job of that. And that's one reason why we have a crime wave across this country. Thank you, Senator Cotton. <clears throat> we have no further questions from the panel on this uh, uh, first round. Uh, Ms. Rickleman, I want to give you a chance to answer a question which uh, may, you may have been cut off in trying to answer a little earlier on uh, your views when it, as it related to your advocacy for abortions in the ninth month of pregnancy. Would you clarify that? Yes, thank you so much, Senator. Again, that's not a position I have ever advocated. As an advocate at the center, I uh, litigated within the confines of Supreme Court precedent, within the framework of Roe and Casey, which only allows abortion up until viability. I've never worked on a case after viability, and all of my cases were brought within the framework of Roe, which allows state limits. And the question raised by Senator Cotton about this article, uh, would you state for the record uh, what you believe the article said? Senator, my memory of this article, which I wrote 15 years ago, it was that it focused on the special needs exception to the Fourth Amendment. I had litigated around the special needs exception, so I wrote an article just about that Supreme Court precedent. It was in no way meant to discuss policy issues. It just focused on an interesting area of Supreme Court law. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Justice Kahn and Ms. Rickleman uh, with this first panel. There may be written questions sent your way, and if you'll respond in a timely fashion, it'll help us move things along in a positive way. So thank you very much for your testimony this morning, this afternoon. I now welcome the next panel to the table as we change the uh, microphones and signs. If you'll remain standing for just a moment.
please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? The record reflects that the nominees have answered in the affirmative. I'm going to open this, and then Senator Padilla, I'm going to invite you to come and preside as I have a meeting shortly after 12 that I have to attend. So uh, let me turn first to the nominees and allow them five minutes of opening statement. Ms. Guzman, Judge Guzman, you're first. Make sure you're on. I push the talk button. Just check it. Um, I want to thank you, um, Chair Durbin, uh, and Ranking Member Grassley, uh, having uh, seen him earlier, all the members of the committee, many of whom we saw today, for taking the time to convene this hearing, to taking efforts on our behalf, um, and I appreciate um, the attention this matter is getting. I want to thank... Um, Senator Warren and Senator Markey for their unbelievably generous comments, uh, and um, I also am deeply, deeply honored by President Biden's nomination, and I'm quite humbled by that as well. I have with me today uh, people who are representing all aspects of my life. I have several um, court um, uh, and professional colleagues who are here and we know um, that our, the air court and the lower court are watching, uh, and they're watching it uh, in time, in real time. I also have uh, family members here. Two of my sisters, my niece is here. I, we have a huge uh, family and a very geographically scattered family, and the three people who are here are representing all of them very well. Um, I also have one of my dearest friends who's present here, and she is representing all the good wishes from the other people uh, in my universe. The person who's not here, but who really sits here in the most, in the biggest way is my mother. She passed away 20 years ago. She was someone who was born two weeks after the stock market crash, uh, the eighth child of an Irish family. Her father died in 1932 in a tragic accident, and they grew up in the depths of the depression. Um, she had many challenges in her life. But what she always was, despite the circumstances that she grew up in, she was positive, faithful, compassionate, funny, and very, very smart. She is my guide. We, were, we had very modest life circumstances, and she always found time and, and, and goods to give to people who had less. She was a fierce, fierce critic of injustice. And she showed us how to fight for ourselves, and more importantly, fight for people who were weaker and less in less circumstances to fight for themselves. I carry her with me every day I go on the bench for every case that I have ever tried. She was so proud of her daughter, the lawyer. She didn't get to see me be a judge. And I can tell you that right now, if it is possible, she is looking down at this hearing without having to change her seat uh, and hold her tongue. Uh, I thank you all very much for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Hogan. Good morning, all. Thank you, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley, for scheduling this hearing, and to all the committee's members for your time today. I would like to thank President Biden for the honor of this nomination and Senators Padilla and Feinstein for recommending me and for the generous introductions. I'd like to introduce the committee to a few family members who accompanied me today. First, my mother, Rosa Origin, who taught me the value of hard work, constant learning, and to chase my dreams. As a young woman, she defied her father to pursue her education. In her early 30s, she started over in the United States because she had faith that this country could offer her and her children tremendous opportunities. She consistently tells people that I alone am to be commended for my accomplishments. She's wrong, and I want to thank her for all of the choices and sacrifices she made that provided me the opportunities that have led me to this great honor. Sitting with my mother is my spouse, Brian, who has been a source of unwavering support since we first met nearly 20 years ago. Thank you for being my partner in all things and for your unconditional love. And of course, my not so little one. Mijita, you are brave, resilient, and kind, and you make me proud every day. I hope that today I'll make you proud. 
My brother Alex was unable to join us today, though, is watching online. Thank you, Alex, for looking out for me since before I can remember and for always standing beside me in my pursuits. I'm deeply humbled to be before you all today and know that it is the result of the support and encouragement I have received from countless mentors, friends, and colleagues. There are too many of you to list. I want to thank you for letting me lean on you and for cheering me on. I welcome the committee's questions. Thank you. Mr. Walker. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Thank you to Chair Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and the other members of the committee for holding this hearing today. I'm grateful to President Biden for the honor of this nomination and to my home state senators, Senator Warner and Senator Kane, for the warm introductions and for recommending me for this position. I also want to acknowledge the man for whom I clerked and the last occupant of the seat to which I've been nominated, Judge Raymond A. Jackson. If I'm confirmed, to follow in his footsteps would be the greatest honor of my life. I'm truly thankful for the members of my family who are here today, my mother and my hero, Brenda, who raised me as a single mother on the Eastern Shore of Virginia and instilled in me the values of faith and service from a young age. All of my successes are not possible without her sacrifices. My stepfather and the rock of our family, Reverend Willie White Sr., my brother Dwayne, who was my first role model and best friend, my nephew Contrell, who is representing my vast contingent of nephews and nieces, including his siblings, Bryant and Veronica, my mother-in-law, Juana, who traveled from Miami to support me, my dear childhood friend, Ashley, and her son, uh, my eight-year-old godson, Yavi, who I hope has gotten a good civics lesson today. Uh, lastly, my spouse, Javier. Uh, we share a bond rooted in our love of family as he is the son of Cuban immigrants. Javi, your partnership and your belief in me are my greatest sources of strength. I'm also blessed to have scores of loved ones watching, including my youngest godson, Rafael, my family and friends on the Eastern Shore, in Miami, in Nolensville, Tennessee, at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alexandria, and elsewhere. There are three people who are not here today, but who are with me in spirit. My father, Russell, my father-in-law, Jose, and my first mentor, Carla Savage Wells, who had an immeasurable impact on my life. I miss them all. I look forward to answering the committee's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Whitehead. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley for scheduling this hearing. Thank you to members of the committee for considering my nomination. I'd also like to thank my home state senators, uh, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell, as well as our district's bipartisan selection committee for recommending me for this role. Additional thanks goes to Senator Murray for the gracious introduction. Thank you, of course, to President Biden for nominating me for United States District Judge. I am deeply humbled by the nomination, and if confirmed, I will work hard to show that your faith in me is not misplaced. I also want to honor my grandmother in this moment. She passed at the beginning of the pandemic, and I've thought about her a lot during this process. Her opportunities were limited by Jim Crow, but her heart was open and filled with love for her family. Only in her wildest dreams could she have pictured her grandson on this stage. She used to say, God knows and he sees. I wish she was here today to see this. With that, let me introduce my family. Uh, my parents, Norman and Linda Whitehead, are here. Thank you for showing me how to persevere over life's challenges and teaching me to value faith, family, hard work, and service to others. I wouldn't be here without you. My wife, Sarah, is here. Uh, you're the love of my life, and you've supported my professional journey with all its twists and turns and late nights. And I'm just so happy that we can share this moment together. My 14-year-old daughter and soon-to-be 10-year-old son are also here. And kids, uh, I love you more than you'll ever know. Um, you inspire and challenge me on a daily basis to be a better person. My in-laws, Paul and Cindy Millars, are also here. Thank you for making the cross-country trek to support me. My three brothers couldn't make the trip. They're back in Seattle, but I know they're here with me in spirit. Thank you also to my law firm, Schrader, Goldmark, and Bender for supporting me throughout this process. There are so many other family members, friends, mentors, colleagues that have done so much to make today happen, uh, but it's impossible for me to thank them all. So I'll say to them simply, I love you and thank you forever for your support. Thank you, uh, and Senators, I look forward to your questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Whitehead. Thank you to all of you. Uh, we now turn to uh, questions from the committee. Members will each have five minutes uh, for questions of the second panel. Uh, and I get the privilege of beginning. Um, surprise, surprise. I'm going to start with Ms. Martinez Olguin. Uh, you've had a long career as a public interest lawyer. And in that time, you've advocated on behalf of survivors of domestic violence, uh, workers seeking equal treatment of their faith in the workplace, uh, immigrants, and others who might otherwise have difficulty accessing the legal system. Your efforts on behalf of your clients are absolutely commendable. But now, if confirmed, you'll transition to the role of a judge. And in some cases, you may have to apply the law in a way that is not consistent with how you, as a lawyer, previously advocated for it to be applied. So I want to ask you about that. What do you see as the difference between the role of an advocate and that of a judge? Thank you, Senator, for the question. An advocate starts from a position. In my years as an advocate, I have advanced arguments that would serve the interests of my clients. The role of a judge requires starting from no position. In fact, our Constitution establishes a system of justice that requires that judges base their opinions solely on the rule of law. By accepting this nomination, and if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, I am undertaking as my trust the even-handed, neutral application of the law to the facts in front of me. Thank you very much. That's an important question for every member of this committee and wanted to make sure we had your thoughts on record. The next question is a simple yes or no. Will you apply the law faithfully, consistent with the relevant text and precedent, regardless of the position you would have taken in your previous role as an advocate? Yes, Senator. Thank you. Um, and uh, my follow-up question. Uh, in your introductory remarks, you spoke movingly about the sacrifices your mother made to get you to this hearing today. I can absolutely relate to your comments. Uh, and I'm reminded of the extraordinary work that my own parents did to help me get to where I am. In many ways, our conversation here today, and this in unique ways applies to all four of you, uh, our conversation here today is a testament to the American dream that uh, those who came before us and the work that they've done, their contributions to this country over so many years has created opportunity for this and future generations. And hopefully it can serve as a reminder for younger generations that with hard work and maybe a little luck along the way, their own version of the American dream can become reality as well. So with the last minute that we have here, and I invite actually all four of you to answer this, but as a Californian, we'll start with uh, Ms. Martinez Olguin. Uh, can you talk about your path here so far and uh, of all the options that you may have before you, why you would want to serve as a federal judge in your next chapter? Thank you, Senator. I so appreciate your remarks, and I've been thinking a lot about the fact that in order to get here, I stand on the shoulders of many people who have supported me and helped me in so many ways. And simply put, I'm interested in serving as a federal court judge because it is a form of service. I have, throughout my career, looked to work in the service of others, and I look at this as an opportunity to continue doing so just in a different way. Thank you. Others care to offer? Not a requirement, but an opportunity. Thank Mr. you, Walker's Senator. Walker's the first to hit the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, my mother instilled the values of public service in me from a very young age. Um, I watched her give back, not only to our community um, writ large, but to our church. Um, to our extended family, I come from an incredibly massive family. The, the eight to 10 folks who are here today are uh, not even a quarter of what would be here um, uh, if, if they were allowed, frankly. Um, but those, those values have been with me from, from day one. Um, and for the last better part of a decade, it's been my honor to stand up and say as an advocate, Jamar Walker for the United States. 
And I viewed uh, that as a great form of public service, but I view this as the greatest form of public service to remove yourself from the advocacy realm into the realm of service to others, serving as a fair and partial decision maker so that people who appear before you are confident that they're getting someone who understands the law, understands the facts, and cares about their dispute. Thank you. Mr. Whitehead. Yes, I'd like to echo those comments. Uh, public service is something that's important to me uh, and my family. My mother uh, is a longtime public educator. My wife works for a public hospital. I've served uh, as a federal trial attorney for a number of years. Uh, in every one of those instances, I've seen firsthand the impact that service can have on the American people. Uh, it's necessary work, it's noble work, and I'm here today because I want to answer the call to service. Thank you. I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer because I wanted to fight, period, just fight. I wanted to fight without my fists. <laughs> when I stood with my first client as a law student uh, in BU Law Clinic in front of a judge, something, some light turned on inside of my heart. They were going to have to get to him through me. And it was the most incredible career to represent people, especially people who were thrown away and cast away and called names and could not afford to walk into court with the finest lawyer. So I, I was going to be that finest lawyer for them. And I got to do that for 17 years. It was just incredible. I didn't, I didn't think about being a judge because I always wanted to be a fighter. And when I was nominated and appointed to the Massachusetts State uh, Court, the district court, I realized that there was a way to keep that light alive by making sure that every person who came before me was seen and every lawyer was heard. And uh, to the extent that I could, I would make it right and make the right decisions. It has turned out to also be an incredible journey and I never, never expected I would take it to the federal district court. I did some work at the federal district court and there were incredible judges in the Worcester and the Massachusetts district court. And, um, but to consider myself on that panel would be to have a fantasy. It doesn't happen to people like us. It just doesn't. And yet here I am. I am grateful, I am humbled, I am honored. If I am confirmed, I will work every day in the way I have as a lawyer for defendants and as a judge in the, day, the State District Court. So thank you very much for the question, Senator. Um, it's, it's just been an incredible experience to go through this, especially with this group of people. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now, Ms. Guzman, I certainly don't want to pick a fight with you. <laughs> but. Uh, but, but I have to respectfully disagree. A big part of why today is such a big moment when you say that it doesn't happen to people like us. Clearly, it does. Hasn't always, but it does. It needs to. And so uh, to all four of you, I thank you for uh, your testimony here today, for your willingness to serve, uh, your uh, unique uh, qualifications are not just impressive, frankly, they are very inspiring. And I look forward to supporting your nominations when the committee takes a vote and when your nominations come to the, the floor of the United States Senate. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, all of you. you know, uh, I don't see other members of the committee that are here to ask questions. So uh, early lunch, maybe. <laughs> uh, before I adjourn today's hearing, I just want to make a quick logistical note that uh, questions for the record will be due to the nominees by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, September 28th, and the record will likewise remain open until that time to submit letters and similar materials. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>